Hi, I'm Connie from the Youth Services Room at the Scarborough Public Library, and I'm ready to continue our reading of No Talking by Andrew Clements and published by Simon & Schuster. So the fifth grade girls and boys are in their contest. They are trying to go 48 hours and seeing which side can speak the least. And now we are going to meet some of the teachers. I can imagine what the teachers might be thinking. They're trying to figure out what's going on too. Tuesday after, this is chapter 12, guessing games. Tuesday afternoon in the fifth grade hall was a challenge for everyone. Mrs. Akers walked into the music room, sat at her piano, smiled and said, my, you are all behaving so well this afternoon. Wonderful. Now, please open your songbooks to This Land is Your Land. As she played the introduction on the piano, she said, Back straight, with big smiles, deep breaths, and no one sang. The piano stopped mid-measure, and Mrs. Akers frowned at the class. Now, I know you can all do better than that. She began the introductions again counting in the beats one and two and three this land is your land this land mrs aker stopped she was singing a solo and her high quivering voice made the kids kids giggle she frowned again all right students this is not funny and it's not good we have less than two weeks before our thanksgiving program and we have no time for this kind of silliness she pointed a bright pink fingernail around the room. Brian, Tommy, Anna, every one of you, I want to hear you sing. She banged out the introduction again, and the whole class sang, This Land Is. And then they stopped. The piano kept playing, and Mrs. Akers bellowed, Sing! And most of the kids jumped in on, My Land From, and then stopped. After another shouted command, they sang the Redwood Forest, and that's how the whole song went, chopped into three word bits. And when Mrs. Akers, her face bright red by this point, thumped on her piano and said, what is wrong with all of you today? The kids didn't say a word. Like all teachers, Mrs. Akers understood the divide and conquer rule. When you need to get to the bottom of something, you don't ask the whole class, you ask one student. So she pointed at Lena in the front row and said, why aren't you singing? Lena hesitated and then motioned at the kids all around the room and said, not talking today. Mrs. Akers said, what's that to me, supposed to mean not talking? Lena nodded, only three words. The music teacher was even more puzzled. She pointed at James and said, explain. James had trouble expressing himself either, even under the best conditions. He gulped and took a deep breath. Then he said, not words, everyone. A light dawned on Mrs. Aker's face and still talking to James, she said, oh, so is it like that project kids do when they take a vow of silence to protest there's still slavery in Africa? I read about that, is that it? James looked lost, he shook his head hard explain not but mrs acres felt like she had answered the riddle or maybe partly answered it and whatever was happening she decided to be a good sport looking around the room she said so tell me can you all hum is humming allowed everyone grinned and nodded like maniacs how about clapping can you clap in rhythm more smiles and nods all right then here we go again and she ripped back to the piano one and two and three, hmm, 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 and 24 fifth graders clapped and hung, uh, hummed along as Mrs. Akers played all seven verses of This Land is Your Land. Then the whole class giggled and laughed and hummed and clapped their way through the other four songs on the Thanksgiving program, and they all survived their first wordless music class. The fifth period gym class was less dramatic than music. News had gotten to most of the teachers that the fifth graders had gone quiet, which didn't bother the gym teacher at all. Tuesday was dodgeball day, so Mrs. Healy appointed the two captains, and then the captains picked their teams by pointing, and the first game got underway, all without one word. Dodgeball, which can be pretty serious anyway, seemed especially grim without the talking and shouting. 
There were the usual grunts of effort and screams of terror, and when three or four kids with red dodgeballs would silently go hunting for one player on the other team, it was sort of like watching a pack of wolves go after a lone caribou, a motion of the leader's head, a movement toward the prey, and then whack, whack, boom, dead meat. From the gym teacher's point of view, dodgeball was all about improving reflexes and getting a good large motor skills workout, and to accomplish those goals without any of the taunting and teasing and name-calling and insulting, that was just fine by her. So when Mrs. Healy watched all three games with great interest and she saw how the kids communicated without words, and she noticed herself pointing and shaking her head and blowing her whistle instead of yelling, it was kind of nice to give her voice a rest. Mr. Burton taught fifth grade reading and language arts. He was puzzled at the beginning of the class right after lunch, and like the music teacher and the science teacher, he asked questions and he got three word answers. But he kept at it, and after about five minutes, he figured out what was going on, or at least part of it. Unlike Mrs. Marlowe, Mr. Burton had a lot of patience and a pretty good sense of humor, and he couldn't see any real problem with having these kids be this well behaved. Anything that got the unshushables quiet was fine by him. Plus, he decided they could all have some fun with this limit of three words in a row. He picked a funny story from their reading textbook, a really short one, and he had the kids read it out loud, three words each, and as fast as possible, with him calling out the name of the next narrator. And when the story was finished, he said, Okay, now I want you to, you to make up a story. He picked up a meter stick and said, when I point at you, say a three-word sentence and listen carefully so you can make the story move forward. Here we go. The story started like this. A woman screamed. She was scared. It was dark. Oh no, snakes. One bit her. Ow, my leg. She limped outside. Her neighbor came. What's wrong? Snakes are everywhere. Are they poisonous? Yes, and smelly. Quick, my car. You saved me. Darn, dead battery. Round and round the room the story went. The poor woman and her neighbor were eventually eaten by the huge orange lizards that came up out of the sewers and ripped the roof off the car. The lizards also ate all the snakes, but then some ugly tulips in the garden grew razor blade teeth and ate the lizards, and then the tulips burped giant burps, which created a tornado that made the Statue of Liberty fall over and crash a tugboat, which made a wave that washed all the way to the White House and got muddy water all over the president's polka dot underpants. It was quite a tale. And here is the teacher and some parts of the story that the kids have put together. The period ended and as the students walked quietly out of the room, Mr. Burton got a lot of wide waves and smiles and thumbs up and he waved and smiled back at the kids. No words were needed. It had been a successful class. Fun, creative, lively, and everyone had used their word skills in new ways. Mr. Burton felt great. The next 40 minutes was his planning period, and then came the last class of the day, period seven. He had some papers to grade, but Mr. Burton was too excited because what these kids were doing, well, it felt like a once in a lifetime chance to mess around with words and language and communication, to try something fresh, something special. After all, science teachers aren't the only people who like a good experiment. So Mr. Barton sat at his desk thinking and thinking. Finally, with about two minutes before period seven, he got it. A great idea. Plus, he realized that the situation could be useful to him in a totally unexpected way. And as the bell rang, Mr. Burton noticed that he was actually looking forward to his last class of the afternoon. Another proof that this was not an ordinary day. Chapter 13, Language Lab. As his last class of the day came into Mr. Burton's room, he didn't speak, and of course, neither did the students. The bell rang and all the kids watched him as he put a stack of lined paper on the front desk of each row. Then he turned to the chalkboard and he began to write. This is what he wrote on the board. Today they will be writing only. Nothing will be turned in, but everyone must write all period long and everyone must communicate with at least, at least four other people. You may not stop writing for more than 15 seconds. As soon as you have paper, begin. In less than one minute, every kid had paper, and in less than two minutes, the first notes were changing hands. Todd wrote, 
I still think this no talking thing is stupid, and he passed the paper to Kyle. Kyle read the note and wrote, I sort of like it. It's different, a challenge. And then Todd wrote, challenge? What challenge? The teachers already know about it, like Mr. Burton. He's just messing with us. Thinks it's a game we're not talking. I like talking. Kyle read, and he wrote back, too bad. Think how high it is for all the blabby girls. We're going to win the contest. Beat the girls, beat the girls, beat the girls. Get it? It's a silent cheer, like at a basketball game. Cool, huh? Todd wrote back, cool, dude, it's lame. Here's my silent cheer. Kyle's a dork, Kyle's a dork, Kyle's a dork. Kyle read the note, made a face at Todd, and then turned his back on him and started up a chat with Eric. No talking made it very simple to tune somebody out. A few seats away, Emily was having a hot argument with Taryn. I did not say you couldn't come over after school. I just said, what's the point if we can't talk? That's all. Taryn read the note, shook her head, and wrote, I know you don't like me as much as you like Kelly, so stop pretending. Emily rolled her eyes and wrote, don't be like that. Taryn shrugged and wrote, like what? Emily used block letters for emphasis. All sniffy and snoofy and ouchy. I hate that. See, Taryn wrote, hate. That's what you said. You hate me. Emily scribbled, don't be an idiot. I don't hate you. Come over after school, really. We'll think of something to do, but we're going to want to talk. I know we will, and we can't. And Taryn wrote back, I'm not coming. You think I'm an idiot. Emily read that and then ripped the paper to pieces, and she reached across the aisle and patted Taryn on the arm and smiled her warmest smile, and then wrote on a fresh sheet of paper, after school, my house, okay? Taryn smiled back and nodded. All around the room, kids were having to figure out the new rules for communicating. And for most of them, writing was a lot harder than talking. It was slower, like instant messaging, only less in, in, instant and less fun because there was no computer to mess with. There was so much less give and take that there was, than there was with talking. The unshushables weren't used to that at all. David just finished a frustrating set of back and forth messages with Bill. Bill couldn't understand how to keep from getting called offside during a soccer game. Dave had explained it three different ways. He had drawn pictures and diagrams and everything, and Bill still couldn't figure it out. So Dave passed a note to Ed because he was on the best junior league player in town. Bill doesn't get the offside rule. Help! Ed wrote, read the note, nodded at Bill, bent over his paper, and began writing. Dave looked around for a new partner, and he saw that Lindsay was passing notes with Helena. They seemed to be having a great time, nodding a lot and cracking each other up, probably gossiping, he thought, about something really stupid. He grabbed a clean sheet of paper and began a note to Lindsay. What's the difference between you and a toxic waste dump? But he decided that riddle was too harsh, even for Lindsay, even if it was true. He crumpled the paper and took another sheet, but before he started writing, he got up, walked to a bookcase, and grabbed a dictionary. He flipped through the pages and then ran his fingers down a column of words, and there it was. Um, also, um, U-M, or spelled U-M-M. -M. Interjection, used to express doubt or uncertainty or to fill a pause when hesitating and speaking. So Lindsay had been right about something for once. He sat back down and wrote, Hey, Captain Burgess, how's the war going? Ready to surrender? Dave nudged Jason, handed him the note, and pointed at Lindsay. Jason nudged Lindsay and held the note out to her. And when she glared at him, Jason shook his head and pointed back at Dave. Lindsay made a face and then took the paper, holding it between her thumb and forefinger like it was a squashed toad. She read the message, wrote a little, and nudged Jason, who passed the paper back to Dave. Her reply was, it's General Burgess. Check the score, Dumbo. Girls rule, boys are losers. As usual, you're going to get totally schooled. Jason handed the paper back to Dave. He read his message, made a snarly face at her, and then wrote, don't count on it, always the big talker. And sitting there frowning at the paper, once again, Dave felt this overpowering wish that he could show Lindsay who was the boss, settle the question once and for all, really put her in her place. And in answer to this wish, an idea popped into his head, an idea he probably should have ignored, but he didn't. 
Pressing down hard with his pencil, Dave wrote, how about you and me go head to head, have our own special no talking mark match, starting right now, you and me, unless you're scared. And the winner gets to write a big L on the loser's forehead with permanent marker on the playground after lunch on Thursday. How's that sound? And he gave the paper to Jason. Lindsay grabbed the paper from Jason and read it, and there was no hesitation. She looked at Dave, nodded a big yes, held up her hand with her fingers making an L and pointed at him. Then she wrote something and handed the paper to Helena, who read everything, wrote something, and passed the paper back to Lindsay, who wrote something more, and then passed the paper to Jason, who passed it to Dave. Lindsay had written, Helena, you be the witness, sign here, and Helena had written her name. And below Helena's signature, Lindsay had added, no backing out now, fat mouth. Which color marker do you like best, red or black? Dave pointed at her and pretended to laugh and laugh. He, she stuck out her tongue and then turned away and picked up her chat with Helena. Dave felt like he'd lost that skirmish. Lindsay always had a way of firing the last cannonball. Then he smiled as he thought how much fun it would be to paint a big L on her forehead, if he could win, that is. Otherwise, Dave couldn't, wouldn't have put his feelings into those exact words, but he sat there in the quiet room sort of wishing it didn't have to be a war because it was, well, it was very interesting. Not talking was interesting all by itself, even without the extra fun of the contest and the extra risks of his new private battle with Lindsay. And he suddenly wondered what Lindsay thought about it, about the whole idea. He wondered if she'd be honest enough to tell him. So Dave grabbed a fresh sheet of paper and wrote, I'm kind of glad we're all doing this, this no talking thing. Like, I really didn't know um was a word. It's pretty interesting. At least it is to me. Then he gave the paper to Jason. Jason tapped Lindsay's arm and handed her the note. She read it and then gave Dave a short, suspicious look. And then she bent over the paper and wrote. Jason handed in the paper and Dave read her message. It said, it is to me too. I'm thinking and thinking and thinking. Pretty amazing. Dave turned and caught Lindsay's eye, and they half nodded at each other. For one tiny fraction of a second, it wasn't boys against girls, and it wasn't a battle. It was two smart kids enjoying an idea. Jason handed Dave another note from him this time. I'm not your personal delivery boy. Maybe you and Lindsay should sit at the same desk. Ha ha ha. Dave's face felt hot. He scribbled, you're crazy, onto Jason's note and jammed it back at him. And at the bottom of the page he and Lindsay had passed, he wrote, yeah, but no way are you going to win this fight. You and your stupid friends are going down big time. And as Dave tossed the note above Jason's head so it landed on Lindsay's desk, he made an ugly face at her and then shook his hands like he was trying to flip something gross off his fingers. He didn't wait for Lindsay's reaction. Dave turned away and began writing a new note to Scott. All during seventh period, Mr. Burton sat at his desk watching. He wrote some notes too, but they were notes to himself. No hesitation, everyone jumped right in. Some frustration with writing, it's slow. Some anger displayed. A lot of nodding and gesturing, some hand signals, tapping on desks and arms and shoulders to get attention, some poking too. Mouth sounds, tongue clicking, lip popping, raspberries. Some animal sounds, quacking, whistling, barking, sometimes to get attention, sometimes to bother. Not much boy, girl, girl, boy, no passing, but more than I'd expected from this group. A lot of smiling and frowning and other face making. Not one single word out loud. Mr. Burton was taking a class at the State University two nights a week, studying for his master's degree. The course was called Human Development, and one of the topics they had studied was the way children learn to use language. Of course, this wasn't watching kids learn to use language. These students were already good with words, almost too good. No, this was watching children try to change how they express themselves, trying to use language in a new way. Mr. Burton was pretty excited. It was like having his own private language lab. He thought, if I keep careful notes, I bet I can write my big research paper on this. I can do interviews with the kids, once they sh start talking again, and I can gather information from the other teachers too, there's so much good stuff here to work with. This is great. When the last bell rang, Mr. Mer Burton was sorry the class had to end, and he couldn't wait for the first class on Wednesday morning. For the fifth graders, that last bell on Tuesday meant something else. 
It meant they had to go ride a bus and not talk. The melt belt meant that they had to go to sports practice or to dance or music lessons and not talk. It meant they had to go home and deal with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and neighbors and everyone else and not talk. No one was sure how all this was going to work, including Dave. But Dave was absolutely sure of one thing. He was going to do everything just right. Because if he messed up, it meant he'd be walking around school on Thursday with a big L on his forehead. And that was not going to happen. Chapter 14, Seen But Not Heard. The homebound school buses were quieter than usual on Tuesday afternoon, especially the ones hauling a large number of fifth grade kids. But none of the fifth graders found the ride home very hard. With no grown-ups around, it was pretty easy to keep quiet. A few of them sat with friends and passed notes back and forth. Some read books or opened a notebook and did homework. Most of the fifth graders just sat quietly looking and listening and thinking. For the fifth graders like Lindsay who stayed for soccer or field hockey or cross country after school was just like regular school because the coaches were all teachers and you could answer teachers because of the three word and you you could answer teachers because of the three word rule. Everyone was getting pretty good at that part of the contest. Soccer practice was easy for Lindsay. Instead of yelling for the ball like she sometimes did, she just waved a hand or made a motion with her head. To direct teammates to cover an area or move downfield, she pointed. Lindsay was good at soccer. She did most of her communicating with her feet. For the kids like Dave, who went right home after school, not talking was more difficult, a lot more difficult, because it's a fact of nature that parents don't like it when kids don't answer them. David? Dave had been home five minutes when he heard his mom come in the front door and call his name. He was upstairs in his bedroom. She called again, David, answer me. To be more specific, Dave was sitting on the toilet. David, answer me. Dave knew that tone of voice. He had to do something right away, so he reached over and banged on the inside of the bathroom door. It was the wrong move. His mom was up those front stairs and had both hands on that locked bathroom doorknob in two seconds. David, is that you? Are you all right? David, David, answer me. She was going to kick down the door, Dave was sure of it. He jiggled the handle, flushed the toilet, and was up and zipped and buttoned all in about two seconds, and he yanked the door open and gave his mom the best smile he could manage. Mrs. Packer was so relieved that she bent down and hugged Dave so hard that he couldn't have said a word even if he'd wanted to, which he didn't. But then she held him out in front of her and gave him a stern look. Didn't you hear me calling you? It would have been easy to shake his head no and tell a silent lie, but Dave smiled and shrugged and held out his hands. Then he pointed to his mouth. His mom frowned even more. Your throat? Is your throat sore? Is that it? Dave shook his head. But it's hard to talk. Something hurts. Should I call Dr. O'Hara's office? We can drive over there right now. Dave shook his head again and motioned for his mom to follow him. He went to his room and then to his desk and on a piece of paper he wrote, Sorry, it's a thing we're doing at school. No talking for a couple of days. That's all. His mom looked at the paper. No talking, she said. Don't be silly. Everybody has to talk. Dave smiled and shrugged and he wrote, Not all the time. His mom tilted her head back and made a face at him, nodding slowly. Oh, so you're saying that I talk all the time? Is that it? Again, Dave smiled and shrugged because I could be as quiet as anybody, then she added, if I wanted to. Bending over to pick up a sweatshirt, she pushed it into his arms and said, well, anyway, get the rest of those dirty clothes picked up and go downstairs and start a load in the washer. Only the dark colors, all right? Dave made a face and she said, and don't give me any of that sass, mister. At his karate class, Kyle did a front snap kick without a yell. Mr. Hudson bowed and said, Kyle San, Always yell like this when you kick. Hiya! Now you. Kyle did the kick again and he moved his face and mouth, but he didn't yell. Mr. Hudson's face got red and he walked stiffly like he always did when he was displeased, but he was still being polite because that is the karate way. He bowed. Kyle san, did you not hear me? Ben Ellis walked onto the mat and bowed to Mr. Hudson. He was in the fourth grade. When Mr. Hudson bowed back, Ben said, Hudson San, the fifth grade kids aren't talking, none of them. Hudson San bowed and made a wise face and tried to imagine what the teacher in the movie The Karate Kid would say at this situation. And after a long pause, he said, ah, 
I see, yes, silence, it is good. Then he bowed at Kyle San and Kyle San bowed back. Then Kyle San did another snap kick without yelling. Ellen played the first flute piece for her teacher, but there was a problem. There's Ellen at her music lesson. Mrs. Lennox said, all right, we're in 4-4 time here. She used her pencil and pointed at a quarter rest. How many beats of silence do you allow for this rest? Ellen talked once. Ellen tapped once on the music stand. Her teacher said, correct, but just say one beat. Then Mrs. Lennox pointed at the symbol for a whole rest. And how many beats for this one? Ellen tapped out four beats. Just say four beats, dear. Ellen smiled and tapped four times and then pointed at her mouth and shook her head. What? asked Mrs. Lennox. Ellen again pointed at her mouth and shook her head. Your lips? Something about your lips? asked the teacher. Just tell me, dear. Ellen smiled and shook her head. Then she lifted the flute to her lips and played the piece again, and this time she read all the rest perfectly. Her teacher nodded, smiled, and then turned the page to the next piece. Before Ellen could begin to play, Mrs. Lennox pointed to each rest, and Ellen tapped out the right number of beats. The teacher nodded, and Ellen began to play. When she finished, Mrs. Lennox smiled, pointed at the start of the piece, picked up her own flute, nodded, and then played the whole piece again as a, sheet, as a duet. Neither of them said a word for the rest of the lesson. Brian's mom picked him up after school, and when he got in the car, she said, You need a haircut. We're stopping at Zeke's on the way home. Brian groaned and shook his head. He stamped his feet on the floor of the car. His mom kept driving. Brian hated going to Zeke's modern barber shop. Zeke was this grumpy guy who'd been cutting hair in Lincoln for more than 40 years. He gave everyone the same haircut, short on top and buzzed close on the sides. But the last two times he'd been there, Brian had forced Zeke to do a halfway decent job, but only because he practically yelled at the man the whole time. Not so short on top. No, really, that's enough off the top. And don't use the clippers on the side. Just scissors. There, that's enough. Don't cut off any more. Really, no, please, no clippers. Just use the scissors, please. And that's why today was the wrong day for a haircut. If Zeke caught him into that worn-out barber chair, Brian knew he'd end up looking like something that had escaped from the zoo. When his mom parked the car, Brian jumped out and dashed into the pizza place next to the barber shop. But his mom followed him. He pointed at the menu and she shook her head. There's no time for a snack. We have to pick up your sister in 15 minutes. She took him by the arm and pulled him out of the restaurant and over to Zeke's store. Now get in there, quick. There's no line right now. Brian wanted to say, newsflash, mom. There's never a line at Zeke's. The man's a rotten barber and he has bad breath. But Brian couldn't say that and he wouldn't be able to talk to Zeke either. He was doomed. Fifteen minutes later when his big sister got into the car she took one look at Brian and burst out laughing. She said, Zeke, right? Brian could only nod. He had paid a heavy price, price for keeping his mouth shut but he kept his promise to Dave and the other guys that if they didn't beat the girls well it wasn't going to be his fault, and he had a bad haircut to prove it. Was it worth it? Yeah, he thought it was worth it. So what if I look like a monkey for a week or two or three? Brian stared out the side window and tried not to think about it. Mrs. Burgess was worried. She glanced in the rearview mirror and looked at her daughter's face again and thought, did she have a horrible day at school? Is that what, what's bothering her? Or maybe something happened at soccer practice. The coach of hers can be pretty tough. About a month earlier, Lindsay had started riding in the back seat of the car instead of up front. Her mom had noticed that her bright, chatty little girl was starting to become more distant, sort of distant now and then. And today, not even a word, and barely a nod as she got in the car after practice. Lindsay's mom thought, maybe she's giving me a silent treatment because I said she couldn't go to that sleepover at Kelly's this weekend. That's probably it. Kids can be so moody sometimes. Goodness knows I was. The truth is, Lindsay wasn't feeling moody at all. She was just thinking. Actually, she was thinking about thinking. Not talking all afternoon had made her realize something. For years now, she had done most of her thinking out loud. I've been just blurting out whatever's on my mind to my sister, to my mom, and at school, I just go on and on, and then I talk on the phone all night. Incredible. Lindsay hated to admit it, but Dave Packer might have been right about the top of her head exploding, because that's how it had felt at first. 
She felt like a faucet that had been wide open, gushing and gushing forever. And then suddenly it flipped shut and all her thoughts had been bottled up. But by the time school let out, Lindsay had started to enjoy the change. And all during soccer practice, she felt like she was alone, just her and her own voice. And she felt like saying, hi there, I'm Lindsay, remember me? I live here. Thinking and being quiet. It was different. It was good. Thinking and being quiet. As the car turned onto the street, almost home, she looked up and saw her mom's eyes in the car mirror and instantly felt how worried she was. So Lindsay gave her mom a wave and a big smile and her mom smiled back. All over town, the other fifth graders were figuring out how to get along without talking. Were there any mistakes made on Tuesday afternoon? Yes, but only a few. Every single fifth grade girl and boy was working hard not to talk. And later on, as it got to be dinner time and family time and homework time and bedtime, there were other problems the kids faced. A phone call from grandma, a little brother who needed help with homework, a family trip to the mall for new shoes, Lots of situations that begged for spoken words. Every single kid had unusual experiences Tuesday night, and every single kid had to be creative, alert, and quiet. But it's not time to tell about all that. It's time to go back to school, back in time to about 3.30 on Tuesday afternoon, back to the conference room next to the office, because that's where the principal and the fifth grade teachers had held a special meeting and they had had plenty to talk about. So the contest is going pretty well, actually. Can you imagine how hard it might be not to talk and not even to say why you're not talking? Think of different situations and how that would feel. I really liked Mr. Burton's idea of the three word story. You should try that with your family and your friends. I also think it's interesting that the kids are being less insulting and they're thinking more before they communicate. And think of all the different ways they're communicating. Nodding, writing, making motions with their hands, making some sounds. It's all pretty interesting. I'm looking forward to next time when we get together to continue reading No Talking by Andrew Clements. See you then.